Okay, Dean, you're ready to go. I am introducing Dean DeBolt from the University of West Florida, who's going to talk about intellectual property in libraries and archives. Thanks, Dean. All right, I'm going to talk about intellectual property in libraries and archives. And quite briefly, a similar book uh, that we're using talks about human intellectual property are products of human intelligence that have potential commercial value. These are ideas, designs, inventions, literary works, unique names, industrial processes, computer programs, other kinds of things. In archives, those kind of intellectual property that we talk about that have commercial value are things like manuscripts, unpublished books, photographs, drawings, original maps, all kinds of, of things, sometimes sketchbooks, sometimes artwork. You then can, it, from artwork, unpublished study, journal, diary, regard of, uh, even original, original artwork, folk art, and, and those kinds of things. In libraries, we're going to talk about libraries first. In libraries, intellectual property tends to be in the published collections, which are published books, government documents, newspapers, serials such as magazines, newsletters, and other published things. I would say that in libraries and intellectual property management, there's not seem to be a major issue, mainly because libraries acquire most of the material they acquire already under some form of copyright, and libraries tend to shift the responsibility for the use or misuse of these to the users. The exception for those tend to be libraries that also house archives, special collections, new bands, and other departments that may acquire material that are considered unpublished or have not been uh, marketed, for example. For libraries, the U.S. Copyright Act protects the intellectual property rights of published works. And it originated right with the start of the Republic with, with Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 of the U.S. Constitution, where Congress would have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited time to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discovery. This is a very interesting clause in the Constitution because uh, the courts have, have debated what the term limited time refer to um, and what kinds of exclusive rights uh, are enjoyed with that. The U.S. Copyright Act amended in 1998 is a little, uh, is a little tricky. But basically, for library materials that are published before 1923, the work is in the public domain. That is, it can be freely used, cited. I see a lot of books before 1923 that are, are published on Amazon by infant publishers and, and other kinds of things. Between 1923 and 1963, the copyright covered 28 years. It could be renewed for 47 years. And the act in 1998 extended that for 20 years. This one kind of tricky because theoretically, if a work was not renewed after the end of 28 years and there was a formal process for that, then it might fall into the public domain because the copyright has expired. Um, pub material published between 1964 and 1977 were, again, 28 years, but they were automatically extended for six to seven years. And material published from 1978 forward is the life of the author plus 70 years. That, that's why they just came out with a list of the, of the top dead, uh, dead authors and their income that they're producing with Michael Jackson at the top of the list. Charles Schultz has earned $13 million last year, although he's been, he died several years ago. One of the difficulties of the Copyright Act is technically it, it has not kept pace with technology very well. There's some fuzziness in it about issues like museum objects and digital creation. The internet has brought along many issues concerning access, ownership, issues with Google Print. And there have been conflicting court decisions at different levels, which make it more difficult. And technically, in working with copyright, it's to err on the cautious side, seek legal counsel, and caution on responsibility. In library, users are the ones who copy the copyrighted material, tending to either scanning or photocopying. And they, we put up, well, we'll come up to that, but we put up a big sign and we make them the liable party. If a library and archive museum staff, however, make the copy, the staff then become personally liable for violations of the copyright law. Library were held harmless because what they, they transfer the responsibility to the user by putting large signs up next to the copier or even writing library uh, statements uh, 
that say that the responsibility of the violation of the law is, is the copyright, is the person making making the copy. Um, and uh, so libraries, and when I talk to library staff, that a lot of them don't know anything about the copyright. They don't worry about it. They just put the signs up and they figure all is, all is well in the world. But archive is much more complex, and I show you two pictures of two of my working piles right now. Um, and I'm, I'm honest about it because stuff that's come in through the door and there's boxes and piles of, of material. And we receive a wide variety of material. Now, before 1976, the copyright law distinguished between what they call published and unpublished material. But in 1976, the copyright law rescinded all the previous differences. And they placed all material, whether published or unpublished, under copyright for the life of the creator plus 50 years, which was changed a few years ago to 70 years. What that means is a, person, a material is under a, co a copyright even if the person had not formally applied to the copyright law, paid a, paid a fee and, and written the thing. So if I'm holding a, a document here that... Uh, that is that the and the author it is it is still copyrighted by the creator for for 70 years after after their death. Now the many archive museum historical societies frankly are not aware that they while they may own the property right to a group of family papers or material they really don't own the copyright to the letter unless the writer died 70 years ago or if the writer themselves conveyed copyright to the archive. A lot of my users don't realize that that uh, they have three letters written to them by by somebody. They donate the collection to the archive. They sign over the copyright. They they are signing over what any copyright they possess. That is, that they have copies of letters they've written, but they can't sign over the copyright to the letters that are in there that were written from other people to them. We have the property, but we don't have the copyright. So, for legal purposes in an archive, we require donors to sign a form that transfers both the property right and the copyright to the institution. Property rights and copyright are indeed rights that can be passed down through wills, through estates, by conveyance to other people. And so, therefore, ownership of the item does not always convey that you have copyright to it. Give you an example. This is a lovely painting we have in Moss Hill Methodist Church in Vernon, Florida. Uh, this lady exhibited her artworks in our library from 40 years ago. The library bought about three or four copies of her print painting. Uh, quite frankly, I have the physical ownership. I don't have the copyright, which means that Elizabeth Landreth or her estate could sue me for putting it in this slide, for example. So everybody keep mum about that. Um, but essentially, we can't reproduce and copy this this painting uh, commercially or marketable because we don't have the copyright, own the copyright to the painting. On the other hand, this letter that we found in our two car garage in North Hill section of Pensacola and a bunch of family paper, which were written to them by this gentleman named Thomas Jefferson to uh, Benjamin Hawkins in Pensacola in 1803, is indeed public domain because the author died in 1826, and so therefore it is out of copyright. And we can reproduce that. We can make reproductions and so forth. So the problem the archive face in most materials is do we actually have the copyright to the material? In some cases we do because we can have a copyright transfer agreement. Sometimes we do because of the age of the material, depending on the Copyright Act and, and whether the donor is still living or not living. And also sometimes uh, because of this we have to re place restriction on the use of the material by users. The issues are that mature, the, so coming up with the copyright comes up with question like, can the material be freely copied? Can they be public? Can they be digitized and placed online? Can the material be reproduced for sale where we're making income by selling postcards and book illustration and poster? And can users make copies of material? These are all questions that depend on almost an item by item basis. There's some other questions in all this involving copyright and intellectual property of, of, your, of your collection. And I call it, do you want to give away your collection? There's ethical consideration, pride of ownership, 
youth tied to budget and support, recouping the investment. I recall we were offered a very important set of rare manuscript letters by an autograph dealer, and we purchased the collection. We actually went out and raised money from donors, and we bought the collection. It was a small collection, probably about 100 items, but they were very valuable, very important to us in terms of history and context. And a week after we got them, I had a user come in and ask, could they have a photocopy, a photocopy of the entire set? And I went to the director of the library and I said, here's my question. And his jaw just dropped because he'd just gone out and raised all this money to buy this stuff. And so the question, that comes, becomes an ethical consideration. Sometimes if you want to copy everything in your collection, pretty soon everyone has copies of your collection. Uh, why should they need a path to your door? These are all kinds of ethical things that come up in control of the, of the intellectual property. And the delicate balance in an archive, we tend to say that use and access are two different things. Access is different than copying. Our users believe access to a collection means I can get a copy of everything, and I can digitize everything, and I can scan everything, and I can whip out my smartphone and take a picture of everything. Um, use and use of the collection and access to, to our point of view are two different things. You may also have to decide on the risk value. In other words. Is, is, uh, is the painter of that painting I showed you really going to come back and sue you for, for reproducing it on a postcard or making copies for somebody? You might have to decide on the politics. Uh, I have a collection where the, where the, where the gentleman who now deceased, his, his first wife died. He married the first wife's nurse. And when she died, he married the nurse's sister. And the daughter of the first marriage, who lived near the university, came in and was very upset that we had to love letter to the second wife. Uh, her mother was the first wife. And so do we make copies? Do we list them? We have, to, we have politics with this. We have to decide. We also decide sometimes how the, how the materials are, are going to be used. So how to handle intellectual property. You need to obtain signed donor forms that specify transfer of the material, the title to them, as well as copyright to the institution. You need to note in your policy that access and use material is subject to the copyright law. You may have to specify that the that staff have the right of refusal to make copy or to refuse somebody the right to copy material. You might have to have users sign a waiver for anything that they copy. Your policy should also identify the individual and chain of command for decision making on some of these requests. Uh, and some of them, depending on the circumstances, might go up, have to go up to a higher level than, than they are. Um, and your registration forms in an archive should clearly state some of your policies. Are you, do you permit copying? Is copying not permitted? Does a person have to request somebody to do that? Do you uh, permit digital photographs of materials that you have? Another aspect of the copyright law that's referred to in libraries is fair use. Fair use is considered reproduction or without permission of the copyright owner. Fair use is governed by purpose and nature. Uh, by the nature of the copyrighted work, the amount of portion used for the whole work, if that is effective use upon the potential market. Uh, Section 107 lists fair uses. Fair uses can be criticism, commentary, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, research. Uh, parodies is one of them, so you can parody uh, the president and John McCain in, in Star Trek uniform, for example. Uh, but there are some there are some real difficulties in determining the blurry edge between what fair use and infringement. Uh, I went in Amazon, typed the word copyright law, came out with uh, came back with uh, twenty seven thousand results, uh, and the law uses the phrase limited and transformative purpose. I know Laura Nemers is going to talk a little more about this when we get to her session, but frankly, millions of dollars in legal fees have been spent on defining fair use. And there are misconceptions about fair use. People say, well, it's fair to use this because I'm acknowledging that it, where it came from, or our organization is nonprofit, we don't make any money, or, uh, you know, disclaimer in the internet. And copyright attorneys and copyright law uh, don't take these things, they do not, even not protection. Um, 
at the university, our, our attorney turned down my request to put on our website a statement that said anyone using this website, using any images from the uh, archive website is, is responsible for their misuse and, and that kind of thing because she said it wasn't legally enforceable, for example. Well, there is a blurry area. One of the books I recommend people is called Getting Permission. Um, by Richard Dim, who's an attorney, have a number of other publications about rights and, and other kinds of things. It will probably scare you more than it will be of some help. But the purpose of this is to give you some idea of the policies and things that you should be using, that you should build in your policy. You may not have the answer, but the idea is to build in your policy the uh, how you're going to handle this issue, how you're going to handle reproductions, how you're going to handle copyrights and the use of intellectual property. I will say that there, that it's always changing. Um, the courts make various decisions. For example, a few years back, uh, my department, we worked with Eric Kess at the University of Florida. We wanted to digitize the early uh, British records, the book called the Colonial Office Series 5 record, which governed uh, British West Florida in the 1700s. We wanted to dig we have them on microfilm. We wanted to digitize them, place them online. We had to apply to Great Britain for permission to do that. It turns out because Great Britain is a monarchy, all government documents are copyrighted by the, by the uh, monarchy. Uh, and, uh, and that copyright has no limits to it. So even though the, the documents were 200, 250 years old, uh, Windsor Castle denied us uh, the permission to scan them and put them online because the copyright was still vested in the Queen, and we were assured that it wasn't an issue they wanted to bring up to the Queen. I, I don't know. That, that's kind of the, the wordage that I saw. And so thank you very much. And I will probably go on to, to Laura if there are any questions. Thanks so much, Dean. We'll take questions after Laura's presentation. I think it's easier if we do the, the questions once we've, we've heard from Laura. So I will now introduce Laura Nemmers, Registrar at the Harn Museum of Art at the University of Florida. Here you go, Laura. Good morning, um, and thank you for allowing me to present to you on the topic of the museum's perspective on intellectual property. Overall, there are four categories of intellectual property, copyright, trademark, patent, and trade secrets. Copyright protects original works that exist in tangible form. This includes literary work and publications, works of art and architectural works. The laws of copyright protect these objects for a specific period of time from being copied, distributed, and displayed. A work does not have to be registered with the Copyright Office to be protected, but it can help the creator's argument in a court of law. Copyright law varies from country to country. A work that is not protected by copyright is in the public domain. These are works that can be freely used. This includes published or created work before 1923, works in which the copyright terms have expired, works in which the author failed to satisfy the required formalities for copyright, or if the work is a work of the US government. This is a simple chart to help you identify if works are in the public domain. As an art museum, we generally assign the public domain status to anything created before January 1, 1923. At the harm, we try to obtain non-exclusive copyright to everything we can in the museum. Our non-exclusive agreement allows us to use the images for advertising and educational purposes only. If we cannot obtain non-exclusive copyright, at best we try to identify the copyright holder. All of this information is stored in the database and in the object records file. All commercial copyright needs are managed through our marketing and PR office. Those would include things like objects you want to sell in the store or shirts or postcards, that type of thing. This is an example of how we identify the copyright status in the database. The red arrows indicate places where the copyright is noted on the front card of the database. So everybody should know what kind of copyright it has or if we've started the research for the copyright as well. Since we're a university museum, we're fortunate enough to have an art law interns that are eager to work on the copyright holder research and noting those types of things in our database. Trademarks are protected as being intellectual property. Trademarks include symbols, phrases, and distinctive words that distinguish specific goods and services. 
The laws regarding trademark vary from country to country. I don't think I need to explain trademarks to you, as I'm sure you recognize at least one or two of them here. Patent law protects inventions, processes, and chemical composition. This law gives the whole the patent, the right to stop others from creating, selling, or using their designs and products without permission. Trade secrets are secrets to be competitive in the marketplace. This could include special formulas like the Bush's baked beans recipe, Coca-Cola's secret formula, or Kentucky Fried Chicken's 11 herbs and spices. They're unique developed devices or other special programs. So what do I work with that might be impacted by intellectual property laws? Copyright. In the Art Museum, we deal with copyright materials every day. This includes, but is not limited to, educational materials, multimedia works, images of objects, image created by a professional photographer for publication. Yes, his or her photograph is also copyrighted. The museum website and publications. Some museums have entire departments to manage the influx of copyright needs and requests. For small museums like ours, that responsibility typically falls to my department and our marketing and PR office for the commercial requests. Trademark. Your museum logo, the title of your exhibition, catalogs and publications, the name of your institution, special educational programs, and slogans are all areas in which trademark law can impact and protect your museum. Patents. Museums can patent original designs or processes. This includes exhibition fabrication techniques and hardware, exhibition setup, processes for research, and special designs. Trade secrets. Museums can have specific plans and ideas that are considered trade secrets that they don't share with others. These may include things like imaging techniques, business ventures, internally written computer programs, marketing plans and strategies, and also donor lists. At an art museum, Copyright is the form of intellectual property that we deal with the most. So I want to go into more detail in regards to copyright, specifically copyright and fair use. So exactly what does copyright do? It gives the owner of the intellectual property, in our case, the artist or author, the intellectual property over adaptation as a derivative of the work. Examples of this include the Obama poster at the top right. The Associated Press filed suit against artist Shepard Ferry for copyright infringement as he used a photojournalist photo to make the image on the poster. He said that the photo portrays facts, so it is fair use. The party settled out of court. If Ed went to court, it is likely that it wouldn't be considered fair use, as he was using the image to make money. The sculpture by Jeff Koons on the bottom from 1998 was in an exhibition in New York. Jeff Koons commissioned the artwork by sending in a postcard he found by Art Rogers to his fabricator. The only differences between the postcard image and the sculpture are that the work is in color and the exaggerated puppy's noses. Kuhn said that the work was a parody and therefore fair use. The court ruled against him as there was no public awareness or message about the artwork. There was a financial settlement and Kuhn's also had to send the unsoaked sculpture to Art Rogers as part of the settlement. Lastly, the appropriated photos of Sherry Levine from 1981, shown here in the center. These controversial works by Levine are direct copies of photographs by Walker Evans depicting poor Alabama sharecroppers that he took in 1936 while he was working for the United States government. Levine re-photographed them as her own. There really wasn't any basis to take her to court for the direct copying as they were created while Evans was working for the US government. But believing her photographs to be copyright infringement, but believing her photographs to be copyright infringement, the estate of Walker Evans bought the entire collection to prevent anyone else from doing it again. Sorry. Uh, reproduction. Reproduction is just simply copying the work. Distribution, as in to make work available for the public by sale, rental, lease, or lending. Performance or display, as in film, slide, play, or dance recital. And exhibition is also copyrighted. As noted in the UCLA Law Review in regards to exhibition, infringement does not occur where a work of art is displayed without an accompanying offer to sell if care is taken to deter copying. As a museum, we're not selling the work on display. 
Thus, the exhibition of a work of art by a museum does not amount to infringement when public is admitted to view the work with the understanding that no copying will take place and that these restrictions will be enforced by the museum. So I've mentioned the term fair use a few times now, but what exactly is fair use? Fair use is a mechanism that allows for an exception to the general rules regarding exclusive rights of copyright holders. Under the fair use doctrine, copying for the purpose of criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, or research is permissible. In addition, copying or photographing a work for internal registration or archival permit purposes is permitted. This sounds awesome, but how is it really determined? This chart from LaGrange College Lewis Library shows some considerations you should take to determine if something might be fair use. I'll let you look at that for just a moment. The problem with fair use is that it's not always clear. There's no specific number of words, lines, or notes that may be safely taken without permission. Acknowledging the source of the copyrighted material does not substitute for obtaining permission. Often, if taken to court, it'll depend on the judge as to whether it is not fair use. The best course of action, in my opinion, is to always get permission from the copyright holder, especially if there is any doubt. When possible, and if there are other options, we at the HARN may avoid using questionable or copyrighted materials altogether. If you do have questions or doubt, you can always seek the advice of an attorney. The bottom line is, cover yourself. Court decisions do not form an altogether coherent pattern. There are often inconsistencies in assessing whether a work is indeed transformative. The idea of fair use and adaptation can be seen in these examples which demonstrates the slippery slope of the fair use doctrine. While transformative aspects of a new work often weigh in favor of fair use, various court decisions can be made depending on the judge and it is really unclear. There are often inconsistencies in assessing whether a work is indeed transformative. In this case, the Ninth Circuit rejected the fair use defense saying that it was not transformative and commercial to use the well-known Cat in the Hat poem of Dr. Seuss as the basis for a fully rewritten poem telling the story of the O.J. Simpson criminal trial. The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals determined that the book was a satire, not a parody, because the book did not poke fun at or ridicule Dr. Seuss. Instead, it merely used the Dr. Seuss characters and style to tell the story of the murder. So, it was not fair use. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the Second Circuit Court held transformative and fair a photograph combining the head of middle-aged male actor Leslie Nielsen with a nude pregnant female body meant to duplicate the Annie Leibovitz cover photo of Jimmy Moore for Vanity Fair magazine from 1991. The Paramount photo was a parody that employed similar lighting and body positioning that served as a promotional poster for the film The Naked Gun 33 and a Half. The court found that although Paramount's photographer drew heavily from Leibowitz's composition, obviously, the parodic purpose and absence of marker harm made the work fall under the fair use doctrine. While Leibowitz had argued that she was entitled to licensing revenue from the photograph, the court found that parodies were likely to generate little or no licensing revenue. The court took particular note that while the composition and positioning of the models is the same, other elements such as lighting, color contrast, the larger ring on Mr. Nielsen's hand, and his facial expression are different. So this was considered fair use. Did you know that just because you own it, in our case a work of art, even if you bought it, you don't own the copyright? Copyright stays with the creator. So unless they give the copyright to your institution, the rights of the creator are protected. This comes as a surprise to most people. I very briefly, because this is very complicated, want to discuss in this presentation the Visual Artist Rights Act of 1990, known as VERA. The Visual Artist Rights Act provides protection to artwork created for exhibition. It grants the artist the right to claim authorship, to prevent the use of one's name on any work the author did not create, to prevent the use of one's name on any work that has been distorted, mutilated, or modified in any way that would be prejudicial to the author's honor or reputation, to prevent distortion, mutilation, or modification that would prejudice the author's honor or reputation. Additionally, authors of the work of recognized stature may prohibit intentional or grossly negligent destruction of a work. But to date, recognized stature has managed to elude a precise definition. 
An example of a fairly recent case on Vera is that of a mural in Los Angeles painted by the artist Kent Twitchell, seen at the bottom. The Ed Ruscha monument was painted over in 2006 and was quickly followed by public outcry. Twitchell then followed suit under Vera for painting over his work without permission. Twitchell won a settlement under Vera against the U.S. government and 12 defendants for $1.1 million, which was the most um, at that time that anybody had won under this um, Vera. So why do we as museums have to worry about copyright? I'm not sure that I realized when I got into this field that I would deal with copyright weekly and often daily. A few things related to copyright that I deal with regularly besides seeking the non-exclusive copyright that I talked about earlier for our permanent collection are online expectations. These days, the general population expects most, if not all, of our collections to be online. The question, and this is up to the institution, is do I see copyright, hope that it is fair use, or do I just take the risk? At the harm, the objects we do have online have a watermark, as you can see here on the painting by Robert Guafme, the woodcutter, on the lower right um, side of the image. Museums, particularly small and medium museums, are underfunded and often understaffed and are struggling to stay relevant. Staying relevant means incorporating our exhibitions online on our website, through social media, and through interactive exhibitions that may include iPads, surface tables, and video. Visitors, the use of cell phones as cameras has been a particularly hot topic of conversation at the Harn and in other discussions I've had with museum colleagues. Who is taking the pictures and what would they be used for? Do we have permission from the lenders? How will the artists feel about the visitors taking photographs? Museums, particularly art museums, are used to having control over their images and how they are used and distributed, and the adaptation to the digital age is a difficult one. So that's a lot about intellectual property. Now, how can this apply to your policy? I would like to share a few examples you may consider including in your collections management policy. Your museum's commitment to copyright research in the collection and legal obligations. Your museum's commitment to observing the rights of artists. Your intentions for documentation of use and research. How your museum deals with fair use applications in the museum. Who is responsible for researching intellectual property issues? In my case, it would only be for the permanent collection. And if your museum has one, a reference to your intellectual property rights policy. Here are some links and publications that I used for developing my presentation that you might find helpful. Thank you. This is Miriam. Um, and I sort of. I think it's a redundant question. Does anybody have questions? I have a, a slew. I think this really was a topic, Laura and Dean, to which you really did uh, fair justice, and we could have literally talked for hours on end. So let me open up the floor for discussion, because I think people may have specific questions about some things that they are thinking about or that belongs in their policies. Laura, you alluded to this, and Dean, I think that this came up in your presentation indirectly as well. But the notion of um, visitors taking photographs in the in the galleries, and I see a lot of body language um, here saying, yeah, that's something that we're thinking about. And I think the reason it's such a complicated question is that initially, photographs taken on an iPhone were so crummy that it didn't really matter if people were taking photos, because they couldn't pass it off as anything other than crummy photos on an iPhone. But that's not always true anymore. So how does that impact the decisions that that you might be want to want to be making or or thinking about, and Laura, do you do you want to start with a response to that a little bit? Sure. Um, this has been a huge topic of conversation at our museum, um, and also you know all over. I've been reading a lot about it lately, and I think that our conclusion is that we were spending way too much time with our guards policing our visitors. Um, they were spending a lot of time watching people, not just watching people, but making them uncomfortable, telling them what to do and when to do it. Um, so right now, our question is, how will our lenders feel about it? You know, Because we have a lot of loaned artwork in the museum. And so for that, we've just adapted our loan policy to include that it's OK for visitors without a flash, without a tripod, um, you know, just with their everyday camera to take pictures. And we're slowly adapting that. Um, like I said, it's, the world's changing for art museums, and we're having to change with it. It's, it's not always comfortable, and there's a lot of conversations that go on about it. 
Um, and also recently I acquired a pros and cons list on, on just this topic, and it's a really great list. If anybody wants it, feel free to shoot me an email and I'll send it to you. Dean, do you want to add anything here from the libraries and archives point of view? Otherwise, I'll um, call on uh, the Amelia Ion folks who have a, a question. But I wanted to see if, Dean, you had something you wanted to say. Um, the question we had here is, once the, the artist is deceased, where does the copyright transfer to? Um, and I think, uh, according to the, copy, or the copyright law, it's the life of the artist plus 70 years. So once that 70 years is up, you know, it's in the public domain. Um, but an artist can transfer, you said just saying once they're deceased. Um, sometimes they are, uh, their copyright has moved over to another organization. So there's the Artist Rights Society, there's um, the Visual Artist, that Vaga, I forget exactly what it stands for right now. So a lot of times those people will be in that or the estate of. And you just have to do a lot of research to try and figure out where it is. And, you know, with us, if I've done a lot of due diligence, if I have contacted every person I can think of and I've got 15 letters in the file and I've contacted other museums to have it and they don't know who it is, I feel comfortable using it. You know, it's not, if you asked an attorney, they would probably tell you you still can't use it. <laughs> but I feel like we've done our due diligence and, you know, it's a, it's, it's a risk and it's a risk you have to decide if you want to take. This is Dean, and I think one of the one of the problems we have in our archive, mainly, and it's the one thing that everybody asks for our photographs, and that is a difficult area for us, simply because we uh, we never know if the we never know sometimes who the who the creator of the photograph is, um, and the copyright law provides for things like and and people can transfer their photography right where they're doing photography for hire for somebody else or that kind of thing. We have recently acquired a collection of some 4,000 editorial cartoons from our local newspaper. Um, they're published in the paper. The uh, editorial cartoonist assures us that he retained the copyright to them all. He signed them over to us so that we can scan them and put them online. Um, but it's just one of those things that we have to deal with almost on a case-by-case -case basis. Most of the visitors I have that look at exhibits, they they believe they can't take picture because they believe we we told we told people in galleries so much that do not take flash pictures. The light will affect the colors and the paintings and preservation. So a lot of them don't do that because of. Uh, they believe it's a it's a preser preservation issue, which is kind of a good thing because it does cut down the amount of, of flash photography. The difficulty I think galleries face with the cameras are getting so much better. Uh, portable smartphone cameras are getting so much more improved that we may ultimately reach a time where a picture on those is equivalent to a, a professional picture, and galleries may have to revisit that policy. Was there a question from the folks in Amelia Island? This is Laura. I actually have a question for Dean about letters. Um, we actually acquired an art collection that came with some letters, letters from the artist to the dealer. And some of the letters contained things that were a little bit, according to the daughter, that she was uncomfortable with having out there. And we've had um, researchers come and ask us for those letters. So what do you do if you have things that maybe a third party, maybe a later family member, isn't comfortable with somebody having, even if they weren't the donor, but you know the, the letter talks about their father? How do you handle something like that? That's going to have to be a, an individual decision on, on how you, whether you re restrict that kind, of, that kind of thing or not. Um, Archivists, we take the high road. We say that a researcher has a legitimate interest in looking at, at material, even if they're controversial, even if the, the materials in them are, are, are a problem. On the other hand, there's a political aspect to this, that if you have dealt with this donor, the donor is still alive, and if the artist, they transferred the letter to you, you may, in an archive, you do have the right sometimes to restrict access to these things because of of what they might contain or or what what's there. Uh, my archive is open to everybody, so I get third graders to people in their 90s doing research. I'm sure there are some collections that have materials that I'm not sure I would want third graders reading through the letters. 
So we can place those kind of restrictions on things. Again, you run a risk here, and that is uh, the last thing you need is any publicity of somebody screaming that you denied them access to records or to a collection because of or you were being a, a censor or something. So we we sit on the we sit on the fence in archives between sometimes making completely a, open access to something and sometimes maybe limiting access because of the politics or the issues or or the thing going on. It's not a happy situation, but it's something that we sometimes have to deal with. This is Miriam. I, I know this is a huge topic, and I can tell from the, the head shaking and the body language here in South Florida that um, uh, there probably are a huge number of questions. Does anybody else have a, a quick question before we turn to discussion around the conference room table? <laughs> 